Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air. The tornado watch for Chicago, tracking severe storms from the Midwest headed right into the Northeast. Also breaking right now, the images coming in tonight, major fires burning out of control. Entire communities surrounded. The Texas governor at this hour declaring a disaster. Authorities saying in some places there is no way out. Winds whipping up the smoke and flames. One fire burning across 200,000 acres. Roads closed tonight. Residents urged to shelter in place. Authorities say it is impossible to get out. What we're learning right now. This is all part of the intense heat just ahead of this major cross-country storm. 45 states from Washington state to Texas to the northeast all under alerts. That tornado watch in Chicago, then blizzard warnings, heavy rain, damaging winds as this now moves from the Midwest into the east. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City all get hit tomorrow. Ginger Z standing by to time this out. The Michigan primary tonight and what could be a test for President Biden. How big will this protest vote be? Some voters angry with his response to Israel's continuing military operation in Gaza and want to send him a message. And what Michigan's popular governor, Democrat Gretchen Whitmer, says about voters who want someone other than Biden to run for the Democrats. Mary Bruce in Michigan. Tonight, the gruesome new details in the case of that nursing student killed while running on the University of Georgia campus. How the suspect allegedly tried to conceal her death amid major questions now about why he was in this country. Steve Osinsami in Georgia. The clock ticking tonight to a government shutdown. The intense Oval Office meeting today, the president and the Speaker of the House. Rachel Scott with late reporting on the Hill. The dramatic day in court as Fulton County DA Fawny Willis fights to stay on this case against Donald Trump in Georgia. Who was on the stand today? The images coming in tonight, the massive house explosion, word of several children injured. Also tonight, Macy's closing 150 stores, the other store that company now says it will focus on. And the big test run from Wendy's tonight. The plan to charge you higher prices if you get in line during the rush. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, it is great to have you with us here on a Tuesday night. We do begin tonight with severe weather, the tornado watch in Chicago, the severe storms from the Midwest, then moving east. Washington, Philadelphia, New York City tomorrow. And tonight, several major wildfires burning out of control in Texas, all part of this system. Mandatory evacuations in effect, the governor of Texas declaring a disaster. In the town of Canadian, they are completely surrounded by fire. Look at the images coming in tonight, cutting off all roads. People there now ordered to shelter in place. Incredibly, flames now 20 feet into the air. The fire called the Smokehouse Creek Fire quadrupling in size in 24 hours. We're told moments ago at least 250,000 acres now burning, 0% contained tonight. The apocalyptic scene there, the orange sky, thick smoke, dozens of homes damaged or destroyed already. Police cars blocking the impassable roads. People who could get out got away earlier evacuating, but authorities at this hour say in some places they can no longer get out. Those winds, part of that system out of the west, and now that tornado watch just issued for Chicago, part of severe weather for at least 40 million Americans at this hour. As I mentioned, the system then headed to the major east coast cities, the I-95 corridor. Maria Villarreal standing by in Texas with late images coming in from these wildfires. But first to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z timing this out tonight. Ginger? Yes, so this all starts with the big numbers as far as heat and wind go, and we'll get to those red flag warnings for that really dangerous fire. But let's go ahead and dive in to that tornado watch. The immediate threat, and just moments ago, David, we saw our first tornado warning. So we already know that the atmosphere is primed for it around Chicago, Joliet, Northwest Indiana, Kenosha, Wisconsin. It's not just there, though. Tonight into the overnight hours, nocturnal tornadoes possible in that enhanced region from southern Illinois, Indiana, northwestern Kentucky, and that includes the big city of Cincinnati. It doesn't stop there. It keeps moving east and ahead of it, big time wind from Texas to Maine. We've got wind alerts for gusts of 45 to 60 miles per hour that easily moves porch furniture, but it can also take trees down, especially where we've been drenched and we're going to get more rain. Look at this ahead of that line. The severe storms start in the mid south and then they keep pushing east. It looks like damaging wind, one of the possibilities, but also the heavy wind, Baltimore, Dover included. And finally, David, I'll leave you with 
St. Louis, 86 degrees, an all-time February record high. They'll drop 60 degrees by tomorrow morning. Just incredible, and a lot of this severe weather hitting the overnight hours, Ginger. I know you know that's the most dangerous time. In the meantime, the breaking nature of all this, those wildfires I mentioned in Texas, our crew on the way to the scene, and here's Maria V. Real now. Her report from Texas. Tonight, howling winds and thick smoke filling the skies in the Texas Panhandle with four major wildfires burning out of control. Look how quick it's spreading. Oh my gosh. Hey man, four or five trucks. We can't hold it. Get out of there. Let's pull out. We got too many spots. It is and that's really West bad. Is awesome. The entire city of Canadian, northeast of Amarillo, surrounded by flames. Authorities tonight saying there are no exits out, asking everyone to shelter in place. But it's burning up all around it. It is ripping it towards Scott's Acres. Officials shutting down roads. Head back. We're just going to have to regroup. We can't, we can't stop it. The largest inferno, the Smokehouse Creek Fire, quadrupling in size in less than 24 hours, scorching more than 200,000 acres, and it's 0% contained. Misty West and her family now fleeing their home in Pampa, Texas, with their two dogs. It just moves so fast. Look at that is awful. More than 40 homes damaged in Fritch, Texas. The hot, dry conditions fueling fires across the plains from Texas to Nebraska and Colorado, where a fire Monday threatened the Air Force Academy near Colorado Springs. Tonight, the governor of Texas declaring a disaster, calling these wildfires devastating. Now, forecasters are saying that conditions should improve overnight, but they could get worse once again by the end of the week. David. Let's hope they get a reprieve from these conditions. Maria, thank you for that. We turn to the other news tonight. Now to the race for the White House this evening, the primary in the battleground state of Michigan and the test for President Biden. The potential protest vote from people angry over his response to Israel's continuing military operation in Gaza. The voters say they want to send a message. The question tonight, how big will that protest vote be? And what Michigan's popular governor, Democrat Gretchen Whitmer, says about voters who want someone other than Joe Biden to run for the Democrats. Mary Bruce in Michigan tonight. Tonight, a major test for President Biden in the critical state of Michigan, a key battleground this November. ABC News projecting Biden has won today's primary, but not without a protest vote over his handling of Israel's war in Gaza. Frustrated and furious, members of the state's large Arab and Muslim community urged voters in today's Democratic primary to check the uncommitted box in protest. Biden has lost my vote. Lexi Zaydan, who supported Biden in 2020, helped organize this opposition. But you know where Donald Trump stands on these issues. If sitting out and not voting for Biden means that you may be helping Donald Trump get elected, is that a risk worth taking? I mean, that's a question that I put back on the president. You know, I didn't get us to this point, but Biden did. And it might come down to us experiencing short-term pain with Trump in office for long-term gain, where we have to have a Democratic Party that actually stands on its values. Short-term pain for long-term gain. So you're willing to sit out in November, even if it means Donald Trump wins, to send Democrats a message? Absolutely. They're demanding Biden push Israel for an enduring ceasefire. The president says he's hopeful they are close to a temporary deal. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. Arab and Muslim American voters helped deliver this state to Biden in 2020 when he won by just 154,000 votes. But that support now in doubt. In Dearborn, Michigan, the city's first Arab American mayor, Abdullah Hamoud, tells me this is deeply personal for his community. When I have a resident who walks up, who talks about losing 80 innocent family members and the current war in Gaza, what is my response to him? Well, it could have been worse. That is an insufficient response. What is the message you guys are hoping to send to the president today? I think the message is that the president has not earned our votes. But Michigan's governor is urging Democrats to get behind Biden, even if they'd prefer a younger candidate. I would say the trains out of the station, get on board. And today, other Democrats we spoke with, like union worker Rory Gill, worry the protest votes will just boost Trump's chances in November. What do you make of this uncommitted movement that we're seeing here? I think it's stupid. I think it's, uh, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the Democratic Party. 
Now, ABC News can project that Joe Biden will win the Democratic primary here tonight and Donald Trump the Republican. And based on what we are seeing so far, this protest vote could be very significant. If these returns hold, the uncommitted vote could approach 150,000. That's roughly the margin by which Joe Biden won this state back in 2020, David. Every four years, a lot of eyes on Michigan. This is no different. Mary Bruce there in Michigan for us tonight. Mary, thank you. Now to the gruesome new details tonight in the case of the nursing student killed while running on the University of Georgia campus, how the suspect allegedly tried to conceal her death amid major questions now about how, why he was in this country. Steve Osinsami in Georgia again tonight. In arrest records, prosecutors say that this 26-year-old from Venezuela accused of murder on the University of Georgia campus did conceal the death of 22-year-old Lakin Riley by dragging the victim to a secluded area. Riley was a cross-country runner at her old high school in the Atlanta suburbs and was a nursing student at a school near UGA when she was out running near this lake and was killed. Jose Ibarra is in a Georgia jail charged with murder tonight, and his story is adding fuel to the fire over immigration. Mr. Ibarra has been charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery. It's now a year and a half after authorities first arrested him for crossing the southern U.S. border unlawfully. And in that same time, federal officials say he was also arrested in New York City for a motor vehicle license violation, acting in a manner to injure a child less than 17. He was released each time. He and his brother were living in an apartment building near jogging trails where Riley was killed. Prosecutors say Ibarra prevented her from making a 911 call and used an object to kill her. This was a crime of opportunity uh, where he saw an individual and uh, bad things happen. Unrelated to the murder, the suspect's brother was also arrested for having a fake green card. And the university is announcing more than $7 million in security upgrades, including better lighting and more cameras. David. Steve Osinsami on this case in Georgia again tonight. Thank you, Steve. Now to the real concern tonight. Will there be a government shutdown? The clock, of course, ticking to a Friday night deadline. The intense Oval Office meeting today, the president with leaders of Congress from both parties, and then afterward, the president asking the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, to stay for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Rachel Scott tonight with late reporting from the Hill. Tonight, President Biden calling the top Democratic and Republican congressional leaders to the White House to try to prevent a partial government shutdown just three days from now. Figure out how we're going to keep uh, funding the government, which is an important problem, an important solution we need to find, and I think we can do that. Afterward, no breakthrough, but Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson sounding upbeat. We're very optimistic. But few signs of progress on the president's other major goal, passing new funding for Ukraine. The meeting on Ukraine was one of the most intense I have ever encountered in my many meetings in the Oval Office. Democratic Senate leader Chuck Schumer describing how all the leaders in the room tried to convince Johnson to stop stalling and support new Ukraine funding. The five of us, the president, the vice president, leader McConnell, speaker, uh, leader Jeffries and myself made it so clear how vital this was to the United States and that we couldn't afford to wait a month or two months or three months because we, we would in all likelihood lose the war. The president even keeping Johnson behind for a private one-on-one -on -one meeting. But when the speaker emerged from the White House, he made it clear he's not budging on Ukraine unless there's more spending on border security. But it was Speaker Johnson himself who killed the bipartisan plan to strengthen the border. And he did it at the urging of Donald Trump, who didn't want Biden to notch a win on immigration, an issue he wants to run on in November. Today outside the White House, Speaker Johnson not even mentioning the word Ukraine when he came to the cameras. The first priority of the country is our border and making sure it's secure. Bit of whiplash for people watching at home. There was a plan from the Senate that got shot down in the House. Now we're talking about uh, the border again. They'll have to work this out on both sides in Congress. Let's get to Rachel Scott live on the Hill tonight. Rachel, of course, the question over Ukraine there, over funding, over a possible government shutdown, this Friday deadline now. We did send some optimism from both the White House and the Speaker late today on averting this shutdown, but no deal yet. So bottom line tonight, what are your sources telling you? 
Yeah, David, no deal yet, so this will be down to the wire once again. Some far-right House Republicans say they will not agree to keep the government funded unless Democrats agree to a long list of conservative policy changes. The bottom line, congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle say they do want to avert this government shutdown, and they are indeed optimistic they can get it done by the end of the week, David. Voters are watching. Rachel Scott, live on the Hill. Rachel, thank you. We turn next tonight to the dramatic day in court as Fulton County DA Fawny Willis fights to stay on this case against Donald Trump in Georgia. Here's Aaron Katursky. For more than two hours today, attorneys for Donald Trump and his co-defendants in Georgia tried to prove District Attorney Fonnie Willis lied about her romance with the man she hired to run the case, grilling a key witness, the former law partner of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, about the timing of the relationship. But Terrence Bradley testified repeatedly he did not know. When did the relationship start? I cannot answer that. I don't know when the relationship started. At that point, had they begun their romantic relationship? I don't recall any, any specific uh, dates. Bradley was confronted with his own text messages, saying the romance started before Willis hired Wade. And when I asked you if you thought it started before she hired him, and you responded, absolutely. But today, Bradley said in those texts, he was only speculating. Why would you speculate when she was asking you a direct question about when the relationship started? I have no answer for that except for the fact that you do in fact know when it started and you don't want to testify to that in court. No, I have no direct knowledge of when the relationship started. Bradley's inconsistent account raises questions since Willis and Wade testified their romance began after he started working on the Trump case. In November of 2021, I hired him. I do not consider our relationship to have become romantic until early of 2022. The timing of the relationship is critical. To get Fonnie Willis kicked off the case, the defense would have to prove she profited by hiring Wade. David, the judge is going to hear final arguments about all this on Friday. David. Aaron, thank you. When we come back here tonight, the major house explosion this evening. The image is coming in now. Reports of several in children injured. Also tonight, Macy's to close 150 stores. The parent company revealing which store it will focus on instead now. And the controversial plan tonight from fast food giant Wendy's to charge customers more if you're in line during the busiest times. Will others follow suit? Tonight, first responders at this hour on the scene of a massive house explosion in Detroit. The blast leveling the home. Firefighters are looking through debris for possible victims. We've been told that three children in a neighboring house are being treated for minor injuries. There's no word yet on what may have caused the blast. In New York City tonight, two guilty verdicts more than 20 years after the murder of a rap music pioneer. Run DMC's Jam Master Jay shot and killed at his recording studio in Queens in 2002. A jury convicting Ronald Washington and Carl Jordan. Prosecutors argued they killed him for trying to cut them out of a drug deal. When we come back here tonight, Macy's closing 150 stores. The company's plan now to focus on a different store revealed. And that plan from Wendy's to charge you more during peak times. A lot of opinions on this one. To the index of other news tonight, Macy's announcing it will close 150 stores over the next three years, 50 stores to close this year alone. It comes amid declining sales and a fourth quarter loss. The company says it will now focus on higher end brands, opening 15 new Bloomingdale's, 30 blue Mercury cosmetic stores as well. Fast food chain Wendy's with a plan to raise prices depending on when you're there. The company planning to test a new surge pricing plan early next year. It'll cost more during peak times based on demand. Analysts say other fast food chains likely watching and if successful might follow suit. When we come back here tonight, the new seal pup and the seal's mom getting a lot of attention tonight. And you'll see why in a moment. ABC World News Tonight with David Muir, sponsored by Claritin, knocks out allergy symptoms from over 200 allergens without knocking you out. Finally tonight here, the blind seal saved, and she's now caring for her new pup tonight. Tonight in Chicago, they are welcoming the newest member of the Brookfield Zoo, this newborn gray seal. Mom's flipper on his head, newborn seals, of course, known as pups, and this one is extra special. His mother, Gracie, is blind. She was found stranded in Maine years ago. The father also found stranded as well, neither healthy enough to be released to the sea. The team here monitoring him around the clock, charting his developmental milestones, alertness, mobility, weight. He was 34 pounds when he was born a week and a half ago. Tonight, he's already 72 pounds. And right here tonight, Hi, David. lead animal care specialist Beth Lee with the new mom, 
and the new seal. Him in the background, he is already making so many leaps and bounds. Going into a very healthy young gray seal. And they are proud of that mom who cannot see, but who is caring for her pup. Because of her strong sense of smell and vocalization, she has proven to be an incredible mom. Even this first time around, she's doing a great job. Tonight, the zoo telling us they are grateful to care for this new family and that all are doing well. We are able to give them a second chance at life and hopefully even more pups to come. It's great to see incredible work at the Brookfield Zoo. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night from all of us here. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.